Well, we're all interested in what's happening uh, with uh, Egypt and how that plays into the big picture. Uh, what a delight and an honor to have with us today uh, Theodore Shabbat. He's the son of uh, a former PLL terrorist. At the age of 16, Theodore released his first book, uh, In Satan's Footstep. Now his second book is out, For God or for Tyranny. Um, and um, Theodore, uh, thank you for being with us. I know that you want to remain somewhat anonymous where you are, and I respect that. How are you, my friend? I'm good. Yourself, sir? Oh, doing great. Thanks for being with us. I think we're no all problem. watching uh, what's happening in Egypt, and we're kind of scratching our head. Um, uh, is it now official that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood will take over there? Yes. Uh, Morsi is already, has already claimed victory. As, as Actually, it's been official. He is uh, the victorious candidate of Egypt. So yes, you're, you're correct. The Muslim Brotherhood officially uh, has taken control of the country. He is an open member of the Muslim Brotherhood. And uh, despite, about, despite what our administration says, it's a very dangerous situation. In fact, yesterday you had uh, the White House press secretary, Jay Carney, and he came out and said that we have no problem with working with Egypt uh, and that, and that our, uh, our affiliations with the country should not be affected by religious affiliations. Um, wow. So, and and it's it's very ironic because, um, despite of what this man says, religion does matter. And uh, so far as Egypt goes, you, you know a country by its allies. So you have Iran yesterday came out and said that we support Morsi. You had the Iranian armed forces come out, and they said that that uh, Morsi's victory. And I'll read you what it says as the first stage of Egypt's revolution in the era of Islamic awakening. And then also, uh, this, th th this is more obscure to the English-speaking audience, but you had the, the, uh, the head of the Islamic party of Tunisia, Rajad, uh, Rashad Ganoushi, and he came out and said that he supported the, uh, the government of Egypt, and he says that the government will be a government of the caliphate, the ummah, the Islamic community by the will of Allah. And then he also said, the path has been opened towards Jerusalem by the will of Allah, meaning basically declaring jihad on Israel. These are the people that support Mursi, and, 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 and these aren't the only ones. You also have Qaradawi, who came out and said that, he, that all Egyptians should support Mursi, because if, Mursi, uh, if we support Mursi, Mursi's uh, power in Egypt will help speed up other revolutions throughout the Islamic world, which means other, is other countries in the Middle East, in the Near East, becoming fully Islamic. Mm. Qardawi is not someone you want supporting you. In 1999, for example, you had the U.S. government who banned Qardawi as a terror sympathizer. So these are the people supporting Mursi, and it should tell us uh, that Egypt is becoming a part of this axis of evil in the Islamic world today. All right, now, so what is, what would, how would you describe the spirit of the common Egyptian citizen today in light of this turnover? That's a good question. I would say that, well, for one thing, you have over a population of over 80 million people in Egypt. 10% of that is Coptic. And then you have a very, very small percentage, smaller than the Coptic population, that's Catholic. So you have the majority of the country, which is Islamic fundamentalist. Seventy-five percent of the Egyptian population voted for Islamic politicians in their in their for their uh, their parliament. Seventy-five percent of the parliament before it was disestablished uh, uh, recently was either uh, members of the Salafists or members of Muslim Brotherhood. So that tells us something about the masses of Egypt. They are extremely Islamic fundamentalists. In fact. Uh, three months after uh, Mubarak was taken out, the crime rate of Egypt increased so much, unlike anything the Egyptian people uh, have seen before. People are afraid of their own shadow. People are afraid of walking in the street. They say it's becoming more and more like uh, East L.A. or, or, or a, a very crime-ridden ghetto. Mm -hmm. People are going crazy. I mean, you've had over three or four uh, jailbreaks in Egypt since Mubarak's ousting. Also, there's been some, uh, just this month alone, the month of June alone, you've had some horrific, uh, grisly murders that have been committed. For example, on June 8th, there was two brothers, Ahmed Mukhtar and Abd al-Basit, in the, in the village of Asuit in Egypt, who murdered their mother, murdered their sister, and murdered their aunt because they didn't 
deem them as being Islamic enough. You had also a butcher this month, a butcher who, who murdered his wife, flayed the skin off her bone and, and tried to sell her meat, her flesh, in the market as lamb. And then just a couple days ago, you had a man who stabbed his pregnant wife to death because she didn't vote for Morsi. So the mm. whole country is becoming the, the night of the living dead. What's the uh, status of the military and uh, with this turnover? Are they remain intact, or is there somewhat a division there? There's a division. The Muslim Brotherhood doesn't want the military in power, though they do have some power now. But from what I have read, there's a lot of animosity between them and the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't want the military to be arresting civilians anymore for any reason. So they want to disestablish the power of the military. In fact, when the Egyptian parliament was 75 percent Islamist, it was, it, was, it was taken out recently, but it's going to come back. When it was 75 percent Islamist, um, they were actually voting to disestablish military rule in Egypt. So yes, most definitely, the members of the Salafi and the members of the Muslim Brotherhood want to get rid of military control. They want the full power, in other words, of the country. All right. How does our own Secretary of State Hillary Clinton play into this mix? Is she for this change? Well, Hillary Clinton has done some things uh, that, that don't surprise me. For one thing, she said uh, a couple weeks ago, actually, that the the fate of Mubarak is going to be in the hands of the Egyptian people. What the uh, Egyptian people do, we will we'll allow. We don't care. And another thing also Hillary Clinton said about Egypt was that we are going to make sure that Egypt uh, treats every Egyptian civilly, with civility, every Egyptian peaceably, every Egyptian politician, that is. Well, wait a second. Mubarak is an Egyptian. And they're treating him like an animal. Mm. And another thing also that, that to keep in mind about the hypocrisy of Hillary Clinton is that although she said that America will watch, will make sure that the Egyptian government will treat every Egyptian citizen with civility, here's another thing that here's another story that passed under the radar. You had a Christian by the name of Jamal Abdul Masood, Christian teenager who has been thrown in prison, sentenced for three years in an Egyptian prison. He tried to have an appeal. The court said, you have no appeal. You are arrested for blasphemy. You are arrested for being a Christian going against Islam. This is Sharia. So you already have Sharia laws being implemented in Egypt against normal Egyptian citizens. Why isn't the U.S. government, as Hillary Clinton promised, keeping these politicians in check, mm -hmm. is my question. And their very interesting thing is, the Egyptian revolutionaries, what they did was they replaced the traditional constitution of Mubarak's regime and the people before him, his predecessors, with a new revolutionary constitution. And in this new revolutionary constitution, the, in its second article, it states firmly that Islamic law will be the law of the land, that Arabic will be the language of the land, Sharia will be the source of all our laws. Now, what is Sharia? Sharia literally means the way. Well, the way of what? Well, the way of Islam. Mm. And if you look at uh, you know, types of these laws, there's one law stated in the Quran, uh, for example, in the, in the chapter of the Quran called the table spread. Let me just read to you what it says. This is part of Sharia law. The punishment of anyone who fight, fights against Allah and his apostle and does mischief in the land is to be killed or crucified or to have their hands and feet from opposite ends or be banished from the land. Now, notice the word crucify. The Arabic term for it is sal, literally crucifixion. Now, the last time I read about crucifixion toward people who were Christians was in the Roman Empire. Well, guess what? It's happening right now as we speak. Wow. In fact, I just did an interview with Ed Lyons, and he is a specialist on the situation going on in Sudan. Sudan, North Sudan, is already an Islamic country. They already have a, a, a president, uh, uh, Omar al-Bashir, who is an open member of the Muslim Brotherhood, whose party, the National Congress Party, is a uh, Sudanese affiliate of Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood. Guess what? He is having people crucified. There was a Christian that Mr. Lyons told me about who was taken by his, uh, by his employer and, said, and the employer said to him, if you want to be like Jesus, you're going to die like Jesus. And he stuck nails into the, into the teenager's hands and stuck a nail through his feet, just like Christ, and left him there for seven days. Thank God he survived. He almost died. But nevertheless, it tells us what's going on. It's wow. going completely under the radar.
Let me, uh, what time I have left here, uh, Theodore, tell us uh, a little bit about the book you and your father have co-authored, For sure. God or For Tyranny, and uh, the, the essence of the message there. Sure. For God or For Tyranny is a book that proves, really, it, it offers an ironclad case that we, in this world, we only have two decisions. We are either for God or we are for tyranny. There are no other choices. And the book shows that there has been no country in history that did not know God or rejected God that had liberty. So in order to have, a, have liberty in a country, you have to have a belief in God. So the, the book shows, whether you look at the Roman Empire, whether you look at ancient Greece, whether you look at pre-Christian Europe, pre-Christian Mexico, um, these countries didn't know who God was at one point, and they were very tyrannical. And also you look at other countries who rejected God, uh, Lenin's Russia, uh, Rob Spears, France, French Revolution, the Iranian Revolution. If you look at the Russian Revolution, all of these revolutions, the Mexican Revolution, all of these revolutions were anti-Christian and ended up in tyranny. And when you look at Egypt today, it's going the same route as revolutionary France, the same route as revolutionary Mexico. Apply the, give the masses what they want, destroy the church, kill Christians. That's what's happening in Egypt. It's going to happen more and more in Egypt. And that's what's happening in Sudan. In the Sudan, for example, with North Sudan attacking the South, which is a Christian country. All right, let me ask you this uh, quickly before I run out of time. Um, if Israel does decide to go in and take out the nukes in Iran, is Egypt capable of having some kind of a meaningful response during that time? That's a good question. Egypt is the most powerful country in the Middle East, in the Arab world, militarily. So yes, I mean, I, I, I would see definitely an allied ship between Iran and Egypt against Israel. In fact, I would see an allied ship between any Muslim countries. Despite the fact that, that Iran is Shia and Egypt is Sunni, they will still work together against Israel. Hmm. So uh, if Israel was to consider some kind of an attack on Iran, they would have to, uh, at the same time, consider some kind of a retaliation coming out of Egypt, and they'd have to have some kind of forces along those borders as well, maybe even Lebanon. Egypt will actually use Gaza, the Gaza Strip, which borders Egypt and Israel together. They will use Gaza as a foothold, as a medium to actually launch attacks into Israel. That's what I believe. Wow. Um, if, Egypt, if Israel is going to be attacking Iran anytime soon, I don't think so. I think, Egypt, I think Israel will continue to do what it's doing. I don't think you're going to be seeing any attack on Iran uh, in the near future. But, um, but, as far, but as far as Egypt allying with Iran, yeah, there's no doubt. They're already allied together. You already have the Iranian yeah. government to, today coming out, or yesterday coming out and saying that the Egyptian victory of Morsi is a great advancement for the Islamic cause, for the Islamic awakening. Theodore, uh, quickly, uh, do you think that these bizarre honor killings will continue as a means of intimidation to get the citizenry to fall in line with the Muslim Brotherhood? Yes. Um, well, they already have most of the people. They already have most of the hearts of the people. But despite that, you're still going to see increasing amounts of violence in Egypt because it's just getting worse and worse. The four murders I gave to you, I, I described to you, that, that just happened this month. Imagine what's going to happen next month. It's okay. going to continue on. It's getting worse and worse. Egypt's crime level has never been this bad. Wow. Uh, I want to get you back. Thank you for your time. I, I want to protect it and you. Uh, thank you for your passion and what you're saying and doing there. Uh, Theodore, this is absolutely fascinating. Our prayers go out to the Coptic Christians and the Catholics there as well. Trust that God will protect them. And uh, I want to get people to get your book, For God or For Tyranny. Take a look at it. Thank you, my friend. We'll have you back soon, God okay? God bless you, sir. You're, God bless Good to be you. on. Anytime, sir. God bless. All right, God bless.